Welcome fellow Toastmasters and guests. This meeting of online presenters has now begun. Guests, please know that in order to be a member of our club, you must be a current or former active member of Toastmasters International and have completed at least six Toastmaster official speeches. Or alternatively, if you have substantial relevant presentation experience, you may apply for membership after demonstrating your abilities in a two to three minute speech delivered during one of our club meetings. All requests for membership are subject, subject to approval by the members of our club. If you have not already done so, please change your panel to ensure it shows your name and role if you have one. Right click and select rename to do so. We have members and guests from many countries throughout the world. Thus, as a professional organization, we ask that you please be aware of language or word usage that may be considered offensive or otherwise insensitive due to cultural differences. Please note that we will be recording the meeting. Your video or audio contribution may be used for club marketing purposes. Also, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Please welcome our club president, DTM, Andrew Byrne. Thank you very much. It is great to be here with all of you. For those that are getting ready for the holidays of Yom Kippur in two days, or uh, the fourth and the fifth, I wish you well. And what we say is L'Shenon Tova, which basically means may be written in the book of life. And this period of time of Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur is a point of time where we are all judged. And Yom Kippur is where God uh, metaphorically marks you down for a good life or for not a good life, death. So that's what we celebrate during this time. But coming up is October 5th, which is sort of an interesting day for me because it's the anniversary of Steve Jobs. And uh, he's been a big impact in my life and what he's produced. And so I always celebrate October 5th and remember him as well. As far as the club is going, we met the minimum requirements for the number of individuals to be able to be considered an active club. We've lost some members. We need to find out if some of them want to re-hitch re up. Some of them have already indicated that they're moving along for other things, but it's our job to provide a fantastic Toastmasters experience with each and every meeting that we have as a club and to get our numbers up above 20, which is considered a healthy club per Toastmasters standards. 30 would be better because all clubs tend to lose members, 43% in fact. So we need to factor that in as we're doing our membership drives and we will hear more from our vice president of membership and our VPPR education, how we coordinate that to bring more people into the club. I'll keep it limited to that right now. October 26th is the last day that one can view the Toastmasters video on demand for many of the things that took place, including the World Championship, and you still can purchase that for $45. I leave it back to you, Carolina. Thank you very much, Andrew, Andrew for those announcements. And I'll be the Toastmaster of the day. And the theme for this meeting is ambition. Ambition is an important part of achieving what you want in life. Many worthwhile goals take hard work and determination to achieve. So ambition can help you stay motivated as you work toward them. With ambition, you can begin to see your vision and figure out how you're going to make it a reality. However, some people think that ambition becomes a bad thing when you ignore everything in your life. Sometimes when you're deeply involved, so focused with something, you forget the little things that make this world a terrific world. You may lose friends, lose time with your loved ones, 
miss your kids growing up and leave a spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, wandering. That strong drive to accomplish can ruin lives sometimes. During the table topic section, we'll have the opportunity to reflect more about ambition, the topic of this meeting. I have a team who will be supporting me during the meeting. And the first person is the timer. The timer is Mr. David Carr. Welcome, David, to explain your role. Sure. So I will be keeping track of your time in any timed segment of the program and showing green, yellow, and red behind me. So that will be for table topics, green at one, yellow at 1.30, red at two, and then you have 30 seconds to wrap it up. And the speeches tonight, if I'm not mistaken, and please let me know if I'm mistaken, are both five to seven minutes. So we will right. signal along the way to make sure that uh, folks stay within their time. Thank you very much, David. The next person who will be helping me is the accountant, Sunny Fritsch. Welcome, Sunny, to explain your role. Thank you very much. Madam Toastmaster of the day, the purpose of the ah counter is to note words and sounds and filler words like ah, um, er, well, so, like, you know, but, well, and maybe a lip smack or two. When you call on me in the evaluation section of the meeting, I will give my report. Back to you. Thank you very much, Sunny. The next person is the grammarian, very important to me. And the grammarian is Andy Byrne. Andy, welcome to explain your role. Thank you very much. My role as a grammarian is to listen carefully. That's known as active listening. And what we do with active listening is to see if you use the word of the day, which is greed, which relates to ambition on the negative side, the dark side. When <laughs> When ambition becomes an obsession and there is nothing that you do not put in front of that obsession. So I'll be listening to everyone and how they use their words today. And I'll report back to that when I'm called upon later in the meeting. Thank you very much, Andy. And the person who will be watching us is Kim. Welcome, Kim. Thank you, Toastmaster today, Carolina. So while Andy is listening to you, I will be watching you and I will be using my special glasses to take note of how everything is done online. So I will be looking at, are you centered? What kind of background did you use? How's your lighting? And that kind of thing. And I'll report at the end of the meeting. Back to you, Carolina. Thank you very much, Kim. I hope I will look good today. The next person is the chat monitor, Tricia Smith. Welcome, Tricia. Thank you. Yep, I will be the chat monitor. So I will be uh, monitoring the back channel communications in the chat box, and I'll report back when called upon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tricia. You can be creative when you are chatting, putting words on the chat. The next person is the vote counter, Lou Brown. Welcome, Lou. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. I will not be vote counter today. I will be vote master. Why? Because I don't need to count votes. I'm going to be using our electronic tool, which does the counting for me. So I will simply be the master of all things voting related. I will put a link in the chat for you to select the best of each segment. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Wow. Thank you, vote counter. Now, my favorite part, the prepared speeches. The first speaker is working in the presentation mastery level two, learning, learning your style, introduction to Toastmasters mentoring. The title of her speech is psychology is not sociology. Welcome, Johnny Laidlaw. How does Toastmasters Envision mentoring. Well, the actual definition, according to the club mentoring handbook, actually states that it's a person with more experience sharing their experience 
with someone who has less. I've found with time that that definition has never really been an effective definition for what I envision a mentor to be. We're all persons on a spectrum, all persons who have various fragments of things that we are excessively good at or excessively bad at, that we have great expertise in because we have kept doing it over and over again, or things that we just came across in life. And because of that, we got the hit from life, which gave us the wherewithal and ability to be able to state, the last time I came across this, this was the best solution I found. Does that mean that I have more expertise in the area or just that life happened to beat me in that area quite enough that I gained the chops and senses to do so? Psychology and on an individual basis is not sociology and a group basis. I remember when I decided I wanted to do my advanced levels and I went in to learn I decided to do psychology. The human mind fascinates me. It always has. And I thought that psychology and sociology would be the same thing. I started to learn from my teacher that I was woefully mistaken as it related to psychology and sociology being the same. My sociology teacher and I never got along because she put a book in front of me and said, read it and learn. Um, but it's a lot of pages and I have a lot of questions. You have the book, read it and learn. My psychology teacher, however, took us all under her wing. What she did was found a way to connect with us on an individual basis. The world was opening up in a new way, in the way Toastmasters is opening up to the virtual sphere. We were a bunch of people finally getting to be the YouTube generation. We were now able to have videos and movies which discussed the topics which never got done before. She sat us down, and I think the first movie we watched was one with Johnny Depp. This is me pondering the name of that movie, but I really don't remember. He played a schizophrenic. The thing about it is we watched that movie, got the plot, discussed the plot, and I learned more from the 30 minutes of discussion after watching that film than I did from the copious amounts of time that I spent reading the book. Our teacher realized that she wasn't connecting with us and she had to learn how to speak our language. No fortunately for us, she was closer to our age when she was imparting it, so she was open to the new world and how she guided us. During the course of the discussion, some of us started jumping up. Oh, this is the only one that we have on a type of psychological disorder. You can also, there is this movie and this movie and this movie. She was the one guiding us. But we, based on our expertise of the native space we used to, and her ability to be open to the feedback, gave us the chance to learn via a medium that we could understand that we could see that was more practical than the theoretical language of, read the book, it's on page 575. Learning this, I realized something. All the time growing up with my grandmother, God rest her soul, she taught me according to what she was used to. She prepared me for a world that she existed in. My personal favorite was always make sure that you have change for bus fare for those who don't take the bus. It helps to have the exact change. And in Jamaica, there's a little sign that they post on the bus that says, we do not take $1,500 bills. Yes, I know that sounds like a lot, but it actually isn't just current value. You have to have change. But then by the time I became an adult, that was already ingrained in being done because it was something she was used to. She told me cute little things about when she was growing up in the country and always make sure you have a young lime. As in, pick a line from the tree when it's young and put it in your bag. There were other things that she would impart. Clean as you go when you're in the kitchen. Wash the plates while you're cooking, Joni. 
So when you're finished, you don't have the big pile of everything left. These are all things that at the time I really couldn't figure it out because I wanted to be doing something else right now. I don't want to be washing up. Hey, grandmother, there's a show on. This is TV. If you miss it, you don't get to see it again. But I still hear her voice sometimes. You need to clean as you go. You need to clean as you go. Now that I'm older and in the position of experiencing it and being a parent and having the 9 million things that you have to do without the distraction of it only comes one time on television, I now see how useful some of those pieces of information were. But I just didn't understand because I couldn't relate. I wasn't having those life experiences and didn't share that perspective. And because unlike my psychology teacher who was willing to meet me where I was and impart the knowledge to parallel my lived experience, that didn't happen. Does it mean that I wasn't mentored by both? No, it doesn't. It means that the sociological grounds with which my grandmother raised me, one, where she had her little geographic bubble, and me, who got exposed to encyclopedia and all the things that happened in America and Dawson's Creek, Little Mermaid, and all the Disney movies that gave me a wider view on the world, society, and how we live versus her smaller worldview. It did help us to not connect. Psychology is not sociology, but it doesn't mean that because our sociological experience is different that you cannot pass on your area of expertise because while I might not appreciate it no because I want to go and watch movie it doesn't mean that when I get to a certain age I won't remember Joni you need to clean as you go back to you our Toastmaster of the day thank you very much Joni Great job. The next speaker is working in the team collaboration level two project, Learning Your Style, Introduction to Toastmasters Mentoring. Today, Graham Kearns looks at the process of mentoring, not just in Toastmasters, but in the wider world. Welcome, Graham Kearns. Madam Toastmaster, Toastmasters, one of the longest running advertising slogans in Australia is for a chewy mint lolly called the Minty. Now, in fact, for more than 90 years, the phrase, it's moments like these you need minties has been a part of the Australian vernacular. For the first 60 years or so, the suite was sold with cartoons featuring people, mostly ordinary, but sometimes celebrities, in humorous situations where things had gone wrong. They would seek solace in the chewy, filling, removing mint with the thought that it's moments like these, we need minties. In recent years, the cartoons on the wrappers are just ordinary people doing ordinary things, suggesting that every moment, no matter how mundane, is a moment for minties. I think they've devalued the slogan, but then again, what do I know? I had to search three shops this morning to find a bag of minties, so maybe it's still working. None of that actually has anything to do with my speech, I have to tell you, which is entitled Moments Like This, You Need Menties, Not Minties. But I do like my puns. So let's talk about mentees and mentors and the process of mentoring. In Toastmasters, we talk the talk about mentoring and every new member when they join a club is supposed to be allocated a mentor when they join. And that mentor is supposed to guide every new member through their first three speeches. For many of us, we have mentors that continue to provide advice and assistance well beyond that point. But it's also true that while we talk the talk, we don't always, as Toastmasters, walk the walk, which is why I am so glad that Toastmasters has made strengthening and renewing the focus on mentoring with projects like this one. Although that is an issue that we could talk about some other time. So far, we've been talking about mentoring only in Toastmasters terms. So let's take a look at mentoring in the wider world. Most of us, I suspect, have been mentors or mentees or both. But before I tell you about a time in my life when I was a mentee or a protege, which is actually the Toastmasters preferred term, 
we should look at the difference between mentoring and coaching. As Toastmasters describes it, coaching is responsible for helping a protege meet a specific target, such as developing gestures or focusing on structure or improving a single presentation. The coach will direct the protege on specifics. Do this, slow down at that point, make this gesture. The sessions tend to be fairly close together and focused on specific things to be achieved. While the protege is ultimately responsible, they put themselves into the coach's hands, trusting on the greater expertise of the coach to mold their performance. A mentor, on the other hand, is a longer lasting role and works with a protege on broader goals. As Toastmasters puts it, a coach may require a member to accomplish several steps in the process of meeting their goal. A mentor's role is to support a protege as they take personal responsibility for working toward the accomplishment of broader goals over a sustained period of time. Now, that's largely word salad, but it is a definition that I think I needed to give you. I mean, I'm not supposed to spend too long on this. The evaluation guide for this speech clearly says the speech should not be a report on the content of the introduction to mentoring project, but I wanted to get the different out definition out there that a mentor supports a protege as they take personal responsibility for working toward broader goals. At that point, I want to take a look at some of my mentors and whether they actually did that. The first and greatest mentor in my life was my father. I couldn't begin to tell you the life lessons that my dad taught me, whether it was how to seek joy in every moment or that reading for pleasure is a jewel beyond price, that if something's not freely given, then it's not worth taking, or that hard work is essential, but so is your family's happiness. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was learning those lessons by osmosis. They simply soaked in and lodged in in here, in the core of my being, in the thing that makes me, me. So my dad mentored me, and he made it seem effortless. Now, I know it probably wasn't, but it seemed effortless. Let's compare my dad to another of my mentors, Tony Bartlett. Tony was my first real news director, the man to hire me for my journalism skills, rudimentary as they were at the time, and help me hone my craft. Tony took the time to do two things. First, he encouraged me to grow, to develop, to sharpen my writing and to develop my news reading. But second, and this is just as important, he took the time to cut me down to size. Now, I don't say that in a negative way. This is a genuine positive. You see, workers in the media, and particularly in the broadcast media, like radio and television, tend to have a tendency towards, say, egotism, to believing that they're better than they actually are, that they can cut corners. They don't need to follow the social norms and niceties and rules. But yes, they do. Tony was remarkably supportive in praising where praising was due and in providing information on matters from how to write crisp, clean news copy, to defamation and libel, to where the bodies are buried in the arcane world that was politics in Canberra, Australia's national capital. But he also did not suffer fools gladly. And if you stuffed up, or if you wrote sloppy copy out of laziness rather than ignorance, or if you did anything that threatened his news service, well, you knew. There have been many more mentors over the years, from teachers to Toastmasters, from photographer friends to fellow employees. But I have to say, in the past decade or so, I've found myself as often in the role of mentor as of protege or mentee. That's in part because I love the concept of pay it forward. That is, if you're the beneficiary of someone else's time, knowledge or goodwill, the best way to reward them is by becoming a better you and passing that on to others. But it's also partly because I am at heart a utilitarian who believes in the concept of enlightened self-interest. You may have heard me speak about this before. That's my belief that if I make my society better by improving it, then I myself will benefit as a side effect. In this case, if I mentor others, I will learn about myself in the process. So, ladies and gentlemen, whether we call them protégés or mentees, whether you are the mentor or the recipient of mentoring, the transfer of knowledge is a vital part of our lives, not just here in Toastmasters, but in the wider world. And long may it be so, because now, as much as ever, it's moments like these we need mentees and mentors.
Oh, and minties too. By the way, I'd offer you one of these, but unfortunately, yeah, you know how the internet works. So I'll just eat it. Random Toastmaster. A round of applause to our speakers. The mentoring process is very important because it can be a, a shortcut to achieve your goals. Mr. Timer, are our speakers qualified? They are, and I will post the times in the chat momentarily. Thank you, David. Or pay attention to our boat master. He will send you a link in order to boat. The next section is the opportunity for everyone to speak. The person who will conduct this section is Marianne Grady, our table topic, topics master for today. Welcome, Marianne. Thanks, Carolina. Just give me a sec. I'm trying to get my thing open here and we'll see how this goes. Okay, I'm doing something wrong. So I'm going to have to read these things. I had them on slides. But no worries, plan B. Well, good evening, everyone. It's table topics time. And as you all are aware, table topics is where we practice our impromptu speaking skills. And tonight, our theme of the day is ambition. So my questions tonight all revolve around quotes that have something to do with ambition. So my first volunteer, voluntold, would be Lou Brown. Here's the quote, Lou. Ambition is enthusiasm with a purpose. Can you tell us about a time when your sheer enthusiasm helped you achieve a goal? Mm, thank you, Madam Topics Master. That's an interesting question as <laughs> usually most table topics questions are. What immediately comes to mind for me is an experience back in high school when I tried out for the track team and made the track team in our high school, pretty much anyone who just joined made the team. It's not like you had to qualify or anything. Unlike chess club, I did qualify for chess club. However, I digress. With the track team, I, during my first probably few years, not just a, a short amount of time into my first year, I went from uh, the 100, back then it was 100 yard dash, 100 meter dash to the 200 meter. I, I kind of floated around to different events to kind of find which one was well suited for me. I was very enthusiastic to kind of figure that out. Okay, am I better short distance, long distance, hurdles perhaps? I even tried out for something called triple jump. I don't know if all of you are familiar with that. It is literally what it sounds like. You do three jumps before you long jump into a pit. Pretty fascinating. I think if I did that these days, I'd probably snap my legs, bad knees. Anyway, it took me a few years to really find which event was well suited for my athleticism as kind of limited as it was back then. But something I really enjoyed and I was very enthusiastic about it. And it was the 400 meter run, not a sprint, not long distance, kind of in between. But what I really enjoyed about it enjoyed uh, about it is the fact that it took a, a different, I guess, mindset to really do well in that particular run. Because again, it's not a sprint and it's not a long distance, but there's a little element of each. And I developed a goal, in this case, I'll call it a purpose, that I was going to improve and continue to improve with each event and nail down a time of under one minute. I think these days folks probably run that in like 45 seconds or some ungodly amount of time. But as a high school kid, even getting in, getting in under a minute was pretty, pretty amazing. I don't know if our timer, if uh, you're, <laughs> feels like I went over a minute here. And so I, you know, with each event I'd go, I was probably a minute and two seconds first time, then maybe a minute and one second, then oh, there it is. Look at that. Bottom line is I managed to continue to improve each time because I was so enthusiastic about it. I just wanted to break that minute barrier. Lo and behold, as time went on, when I got to the final event of that particular year, which was my junior year, I managed to come in at 55 seconds. I was so thrilled about that enthusiastic that uh, it was just a great feeling to have. Back to you, Madam Topics Master. 
Well, thanks for getting us started with your tales of your athleticism. On to the second one. And I am going to call on Mr. Smolenka. If I fail, it is only because I have too much pride and ambition. Andre, can ambition be a bad thing? What's an excellent question, Madam Sable Sobix Master. Can the ambition be a bad thing? Uh, to my mind, yes, it can be. Um, and it's something that I probably face every single morning when I get up from my bed. You see, my ambition has always been to have a six pack and build my muscles nice and strong. And when I get up first thing in the morning and I tell myself, Andre, you need to do those push ups. Andre, you need to do ups. Andre, you need to do it. And then I just get downstairs, make myself a cup of tea, sit down, open a newspaper, and I just treat myself to life instead of being over ambitious. So you can probably ask me, Andre, how can you sleep after you failed yourself? Andre, how can you just lack of ambition in your life and be a member of online presenters, advanced club, all those valid questions, my fellow online presenters. At the same time, I'll just wake up in the morning and I go and make myself a cup of tea. There is another side of having lack of ambition is those little pricks of consciousness that from time to time, again, reminding me, Andre, you are a young, good looking fellow. You have no abs, no big muscles. You have to do it. And it's the constant battle in my mind. At the same time, as you can probably see, Graham, he already won that battle with a cup of tea. So there's something that I'm going to do. Cheers. I love your story. And I think many of us are nodding in agreement that we uh, have those same kind of conversations with ourselves. Next up will be Sunny. Sunny, true ambition is not what we thought it was. True ambition is the profound desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God. Sunny, do you relate to this quote or not and why? Madam Topics Master, just briefly repeat the quote. Oh, already, <laughs> already threw it on the floor. <laughs> True ambition is not what we thought it was. True ambition is the profound desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God. Thank you for that awesome quote. I can relate to it, but instead of ambition, I use the word purpose. And I started using purpose in the last five years or so, because before I thought you had to be successful when you have a lot of ambition. It's about crossing your T's, dotting your I's and reaching all of your goals. But when I became a John Maxwell certified coach, speaker and trainer, through John, I learned that it's not always all about success because sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. I also learned that while it is great to be successful, over the years, I've also learned through ambition that I don't let it get too high because I also want to be impactful. I want to leave the world a better place than when I found it. I think I'm on my way. So a little ambition, but also just knowing my purpose, because when you can walk in your purpose, then you know that all is well, because when you're trying to make a difference, changing the world, for me, it's one voice at a time. Each time I work with my clients and my students, 
I believe that I really do have purpose. And since I still just have a little time left, I heard, I, had a, I think it was Andrew who said that he enjoyed Steve Jobs. And I love the quote by Steve Jobs that says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect you to your future. So as I look back at one time trying to be so ambitious, trying to beat the clock, now I realize that it's okay to even fail if you fail forward and you have purpose. Back to you, Madam Topics Master. Wow, all is well with people like you out there thinking that way, well, I loved it, thank you. Next up, I have Trisha. <laughs> Trisha, ambition is putting a ladder against the sky. What does this quote mean to you? Putting a ladder against the sky as ambition means to me that the sky is the limit. And I'd like to say that uh, with what's going on today and everyone's mindset around the world, that the sky is the limit. Everyone has opportunity to pursue whatever their dreams are. And uh, with a good support system and everything that they need, they certainly can. So it's really been inspiring to see uh, stories out there, uh, rule breakers, new people in new positions, uh, I watch uh, Yahoo Finance all the time or listen to it at least on the background and I'm hearing some really inspirational stories. I just heard one today. Uh, I've, I'm sorry, uh, it's Rosewood, uh, Rosewood Resorts, I think it is. There's an owner of Rosewood Resorts and she's from Hong Kong. She's in a family and uh, I, I have to say throughout history, I was surprised to hear that she has four children um, and she's a huge business owner. So they are just like multiplying their business ventures all over the world, Hawaii and other countries. And this is Hong Kong. So I'm like, wow. And just hearing her story and the inspiration behind it and, and how they do their businesses, I that was inspirational to me alone. So all this younger generation, the sky is the limit. And I hope to be a, a good example of at least promoting that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the sky is the limit if you think that way, right? Okay, next I'm going to call upon Mr. David Carr. David, when I was young, my ambition was to be one of the people who made a difference in the world. My hope is to leave the world in a little better place than I found it. David, what is one thing you have done that makes the world a better place, either for you, for others, or for the world in general? Madam Table Topics Master, not a damn thing. I mean, not, not really. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've worked around the edges at um, doing some things. Um, about every four years, I get a little bit of ambition about saving democracy, and I go out and knock on doors for my uh, favorite political party to save the world from the other political party. And I don't know, that this has not always worked out that well. Uh, so I have found that I can knock myself out trying to make a difference for the world. And, and sometimes the world just doesn't care all that much uh, what I think about such things. And so uh, I'm, I'm still working on it. I, I, I'm not saying that I've given up, but there are, um, there are definitely challenges in trying to move the world in any kind of positive direction when sometimes it seems determined not to move in that direction at all. I'm Topics Master. Well, David, I think you're a little hard on yourself, and I know that you've done a lot of things to make my world easier and better, so thank you. Next up, uh, Kim, are you there? Let's see. Ambition is the path to success. Persistence is the vehicle you arrive in. 
Kim, tell us about a project you've worked on either personally or professionally where your persistence helped you move ahead. This is actually the perfect question for me. If I had a dime for every time I was told I would per was persistent, I'd be a millionaire. So I am in sales. We sell to the cable television industry. And I try and like toe that line where I'm persistent in following up with people without being, you know, stalking. And so it's, it's actually been a really good thing for me. And I think it's why I've been successful is that I can be persistent while still being ambitious and without towing that line of being a pest. So um, I think the answer to your question is literally my whole career, my whole life. And now we're starting a new business and I will be very persistent in that as well. And it is an ambitious goal to start uh, a new business with YouTube and with um, video greeting cards. And um, I don't know how many times I've already said, um, this is driving me nuts. I, I am catching myself doing it. Sorry about that. But um, thank you so much for the question and for your ambitious questions. Thank you. Back to you, Mary Ann. Well, thanks, Kim. And you know, we all wish you well in your new business endeavors. I would like to call on Mr. Jim Barber. Jim, comfort kills ambition. Get uncomfortable and get used to it in your pursuit of your goals and dreams. What is the last thing that you did that took you out of your comfort zone? Oh, Madam Topics Master. <laughs> I have lived much of my life out of my comfort zone. I don't even know what the comfort zone feels like anymore. I wasn't brought up that way. I, I spent my youth, my young adult years uh, in comfort zone, trying very desperately to stay within my comfort zone before I came to the realization that that was not where things happened. To get out of to get anywhere in life, I needed to get out of my comfort zone, or as I've heard it described, to expand my comfort zone, rather, whichever way you're doing it. To answer your question, I think probably I was, let's see, I was 29, and I decided to do something that my parents thought was absolutely idiotic. I quit my job, my well-paying job, to become self-employed. Now, this was back in those days. You just did not do that. And my parents could not understand what in the world had brought me to this act of lunacy. But I did. I said, I want to try this myself. I want to work for myself. And I did that. And ever since that point, and that was over 40 years ago, and Every time I like to tackle new things, especially the things that people say, oh, you can't do that. Oh, I love to hear somebody tell me I can't do that because that is that is a rallying cry to say, let me hold my beer. Let me see how quickly I can do this. So I've made a life out of getting out of my comfort zone. And quite frankly, I wouldn't have it any other way. Your comfort zone is, I think, it, it may not be deadly, but it is definitely dull. And it's not the place to have fun. When you wanna have fun, you wanna make a difference, get out of your comfort zone. Back to you, Madam Topics Master. Good advice, Jim, and it seems to have served you well. Okay, Jason, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay, your quote is, intelligence without ambition is like a bird without wings. Can you tell us what this quote means to you? Well, can you repeat the quote again? Certainly. Intelligence without ambition is like a bird without wings. Well, what a nice quote. Intelligence without ambitions 
it's a wing, it's a bird without with a broken wing. So I strongly agree with this quote because what I imagine as as a person, we should have a high ambitious. Why so? Because a high ambitious is what could lead us to the limit, which means to the sky. So what if we don't have ambitious, but we have a strongly, like highly intelligent? That means we are just a wing, we are just a bird without a wing. We can't fly to the sky that we want to. For me, I do have my own ambitions and I'm working on it. So my ambitions in, is to become a teacher. Yeah, you know, I'm just a student and yeah, my ambition is not that, I mean, not that hard to all of you is to become a teacher. Well, so intelligence is actually very important for me, but the most important for me is the ambitious and the persistent you do. Even I have the intelligence to become a teacher or to pursue my dream, but without the ambitions, every time I wake up, I would just, um, every time I wake up, I would just like a bird that being trapped in my own trap. So for me, ambitions is truly important. It leads me to exceed my upper limit. With ambitions, I could fly higher and fix my broken wings or even enhance my wings to become a stronger bird compared to others and fly higher to the moon, even to the space. Yeah, that's all from me. Well, you're working hard and I'm sure you will fly high and become a teacher when you're ready. Thank you, Jason. Now, my last question of the night, we are going to ask Mr. Andy Byrne. Is it possible to have too much ambition? Is it possible to be too successful? Andy, is there such a thing as too much of these things? For me, the answer is no. The important thing is that you need to tie your goals to your ambition so that your pursuit of a particular goal has purpose and that you can identify the metrics that's associated with it and allow you to know when you've gotten there. Toastmasters has done a very good job on that. You'll notice that Toastmasters has metrics for everything. After all, as you're traveling your road, your individual journey, how do you know when you get there if you don't have metrics that measure where you've been, where you're going, and when you get there? Part of that is in the example of the Distinguished Toastmaster. It's a program recognition when you've traveled along the journey and met all the metric markers that they've laid before you. When you have an ambition that is tied to a purpose and a goal without greed, being selfless, you can accomplish great things. And I think that's what our program is all about. Well, thank you, Andy, and thank you to all our participants. I really enjoyed hearing your responses and hearing about some of your ambitions. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Marianne. It was very entertaining. Mr. Timer David, are all the speakers qualified? Yes, Lou gets in on under the uh... Timer fell asleep at the switch uh, exemption, but uh, everybody else uh, was was uh, again. I mean, so awesome. Yeah, Lou against Lou, my fault. Pay attention to our vote master in on the chat. The next section is a gift. It's time for feedback, and the person who will be conducting this section is. Jim Barber, our general evaluator of this evening. Welcome, Jim Barber. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. And as Carolina just said, this is the feedback portion of our meeting in which we provide evaluations of different aspects of our online presenters meeting this evening. Before we get into the evaluating the presentations, I would like to 
advise, remind rather, our two evaluators that their evaluation time is two to three minutes, please. And our first speaker was Joni Laidlaw, and we are privileged to have evaluating Joni's presentation tonight, Antoinette Trim. So Antoinette, take it away. Thank you, General Evaluator. It is such a privilege, it was such a privilege for me to evaluate Joni, Toastmaster Joni. He's such an eloquent speaker. See, in terms of the evaluations, we were, I was supposed to do the purpose of the speech is to share some aspects of a previous experience as a protege and so forth. He did those things quite well. However, with a, in a private chat, she told me she wants to, for me to look at her transitions, which I mainly focus. Transitions are used to clearly communicate main points. Joni used the classic transition style in which she looked back of certain things and now she was looking forward. I liked what she spoke about in terms of clean as you go, in which her grandmother was always telling her to do. Pause a bit and then she went on to talk what aspect as clean as you go. And she was able to impart that knowledge to her children or son as the case may be. I also liked that she used another type of transition style, which is a tr summary transition style, where Joni was able to recap what she experienced in her psychology and sociology studies. And again, related to her present experience. I also favor that she was able to learn more psychology from movies rather than the teacher of sociology giving her a book and saying, you have to read this, you have to read this. And, and also she related those experiences to her grandmother's teaching. Some recommendations, at least I have one, maybe along with using the both classic and summary transition styles. Maybe she can use some one word transitions. For example, therefore, however, nevertheless, and so forth. In order to give her speech more variety. All in all, it was very good speech. I love the various experiences she spoke about with her grandmother and the teachers and so forth. And I love that she brought it to our table and, and all of us were able to really learn from what she experienced. Back to you, General Evaluator Baba. Thank you, Antoinette. I appreciate that. Great evaluation. Our second speaker this evening was Graham Cairns, and we are privileged to have evaluating Graham's presentation, Maru, excuse me, Toru Maruyama. So Toru, there you are, take it away. Take it away, Toru. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Toastmaster Graham Cairns, for your fantastic speech. I'm sure the audience learned many hints to build productive mentor-mentee relationships. I will talk about four conspicuous or five conspicuous things I found remarkable about your presentation. And then let me raise two humble suggestions. 
First of all, the purpose of this speech is to talk about the personal experience as a protege or mentee. By talking an exemplary story about his own, his father, and his boss in his journalism career, he achieved the purpose. Second, clarity. Spoken language is clear and is easily understood as always. Third, humor. In the opening, he grabbed the attention of the audience by talking the popular snack in Australia. Mentees, when he spoke about the mentee, so he used the skill of pan cleverly. That was fantastic. Fourth, nonverbal communication as a whole, such as gestures, body movement. They are fully integrated with the story and enhance the understanding of the audience. That was marvelous. Fifth, confidence. He was fully at ease with the audience. And by that way, he induced us to the world he created by his fabulous speech. Now, let me raise two uh, suggestions by which uh, you can make the speech more fascinating and educational. First, your speed is a little bit fast and flat, so slow down to change the pace sometimes and use a vocal variety to keep the tension of the listeners always until the finish. Second one, uh, one of the most difficult things in Toastmasters in my experience is having a good mentor and having a good relationship with him or with her. So it might be better for you to be more uh, advisable and disclosing your own story more in detail and give us uh, good, good advice to do that. Uh, but in summation, uh, I think uh, uh, you had better use the humor more effectively as always and slow down sometimes when it is necessary and disclose your personal story that resonate with the audience. But overall, your speech was just fantastic, amusing, as well as very educational. And I want to hear more about you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Toru. Oh, you're getting offered a minty. That's nice. That's, <laughs> isn't that bribing the evaluator? Is that allowed? OK, all right. Mr. Timer, how did our evaluators do? Well, they did well, but uh, Toru went a little bit over time. Mm, OK, so our voting is confined to Graham this evening. No, to answer oh, excuse I beg your pardon, and I was looking at the wrong list there. Antoinette this evening. It looks like, Antoinette, it looks like you're in the lead. There's a good chance here, but we'll report on the votes a little bit later on. Everybody, please pass your vote for the best of the available, uh, uh, eligible evaluators this evening. While you are doing that, let's get some more specialized evaluations of our meeting, starting with Sunny Fridge. Sunny, you were the Wizard of Oz this evening. How did we do? Thank you, General Evaluator Chatty Jim Barber. We did well tonight. When it comes to us, Andre had two, David two, Kim three, Marianne, Joni, and Jason one, Toru, you had three, Trisha had five. The other big word was so, Jason five, Trisha four. Kim two and Jim and David one. A few buts, Jim, Kim and Lou. And then I found something that I often do. You see, that was Antoinette and Graham, but I enjoyed hearing it, but be careful about that. The other crutch word 
okay was used by Kim, Marianne, and Jason, yeah. And I heard no lip smacks today, so that's a good thing. Back to you, Chatty Jim, General Evaluator. Thank you, Wizard of Oz, Sunny Fridge. Yeah. And so, okay, I won't comment on the fact that you commented on my butt. I'll simply go past <laughs> that. I would remind our other speakers here this evening that to please limit yourself to one minute or something close to that. We're not hurting for time, but just keep it, rein it in a little bit. And our grammarian this evening is Andy Byrne. Andy, how did we do grammar wise? Looking at it from the grammarian standpoint, our word of the day was greed related to the theme of ambition. Many, many members of the club used ambition, but they also talked about goals and purpose and other related things. I believe that almost all members tried their hand at inserting some words and phrases that related to the overall theme and purpose. So I'll give everybody a hands up, thumbs up for their attempts of working on the word of the day for this meeting. Nicely done. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that. All right. Somebody has been watching us this evening, and it happens to be Kim. Kim Leeming, as our watcher this evening, what did you see? So I have been watching all of you. And what I see is, first of all, Trisha Smith. Lovely, ambitious background. Then we have... Andre Smolenko, superhero background, great goal, a very ambitious. Marianne Grady, up the ladder, getting to your ambition. Lou Brown, wrangling the mood to the moon and back, uh, awesome ambition. Sunny Fridge, okay, you get the extra special award for tonight because you had an LOL sign, which I think we should all have, and that was just awesome. David Carr, timing your own table topics. Very ambitious. Also loved your graphics as a timer. Green hummingbird, yellow, beautiful sunflower, and red, a beautiful rose. Awesome job. Timer. This is not my job to talk about funny things, but fell asleep at the switch. Awesome. And just love that quote. Andy Burned, loved your video background with the Ukraine colors and just thumbs up. Joni Layla, don't want to take away from your awesome speech, but I do want to say that I thought that having more than a plain white background could have been a little more attention grabbing, but commenting on your background is my job as a watcher um, to look at the background. However, I do want to say that your wonderful use of vocal variety and gestures made up for the plain background. You were absolutely captivating. Grand cards, it looked like you were standing. As such, your body language came through even more than usual and your background was very appropriate for your speech topic and great job. Back to you, General Evaluator. Thank you, Watcher Kim Leeming, appreciate that. And you started by talking about Tricia Smith's background. And so I will go, that's a natural segue to our chat monitor this evening. Tricia, I think you had your hands full. How, what was going on in the chat this evening? Oh, we had some good topics tonight, very in line with our theme ambition and greed and I was trying to keep track of all of those things. So I have two people that I saw who used the word of the day, Graham and Lewis, and Lewis was just recently. Several people used the theme ambition. We had some great quotes. There was some discussion about dialysis and then Black Panther coming up. Uh, that, was, that was in the mix too. Some good images shared by um, Andrew and uh, dis discussion, uh, description of ambition and table topics. That whole section was on ambition wonderful share shared information with that some good quotes i could go over them they are in the chat box i think i've got it all uh, so i'd say great discussion in the chat box i would go back and, and take a look there's some things to save uh, if you so choose to thank you and the bobble glasses 
Yeah, wonderful add-on. <laughs> Thank you, chat monitor Tricia Smith. Great report. Thank you. Now it's my opportunity to evaluate the meeting as a whole. Let me start with evaluating our evaluators. Kudos to both of our evaluators. Did a great job this evening. Both evaluators were supportive and encouraging. Frankly, I think that's the most important thing. You can come up with suggestions and recommendations and so on like that, but if the speaker doesn't feel that you care about what they're doing, it's going to fall on deaf ears. It's not going to accomplish anything. So you've got to establish from the beginning that you are supportive, you're encouraging of what they're doing, and both of our evaluators did that great. Antoinette uh, checked with the speaker ahead of time uh, by the chat to see what was going on. That was a great thing to do. Can't always do that, but if you can, touch base with the speaker ahead of time and find out specifically what they're to look for, you should do that. And Antoinette did that. Congratulations. She, uh, let's see, Toru, oh, Toru was great, had five conspicuous, remarkable things that he wanted to comment on. And then he followed that with two humble suggestions. And again, that's great. The ratio of five to two is the supportive and encouraging, giving you room for improvement, suggestions for improvement, but nevertheless, it's, it's encouraging. And that was so well done. So let me evaluate the meeting as a whole. Quite frankly, this meeting demonstrated why online presenters is one of the premier clubs in Toastmasters. The Distinguished Club program doesn't tell the whole story. Points are nice, but points can be rigged. They don't really tell you what's happening. This meeting tells you what's happening. And this was a well-conducted, well-attended, everything about the meeting worked. I regret that we didn't have guests tonight, other than Jason, I'm not really counting him as a, as a guest. We didn't have new guests this evening because they would have been impressed with what a great job we did. And that is my evaluation. That's the best thing that I can say about us. We're doing great. Just keep on doing it every meeting. And now I hope our, our vote counter has had the opportunity to, our vote master rather, has had the opportunity to uh, check with the computer and see what the computer voting came to. So Lou Brown, would you tell us what the results of the voting were, was, were something like that this evening? Certainly, Mr. General Evaluator. The vote master is now going to do some vote reading. We have for best speaker, Graham Cairns. Congratulations, Mr. Minty. The best table topics, Sunny Fridge. Awesome. Best evaluator, we have a tie. Now, I know as the vote master, I am supposed to break the tie, but quite honestly, I was 50-50 on the fence myself, so we're going to have to go with the tie. Congrats to both. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. We did have a timing issue there, didn't we? But you know what? We still got votes for both, so we'll run with it. That's quite all right, Mr. Vote Master. I appreciate that. And it falls under the category of being supportive and encouraging. You're absolutely right. Technically, Toru did not qualify for voting. However, in terms of reporting what happened, the vote count was equal. Both our evaluators did a terrific job. Thank you very much. And that concludes my portion of this general evaluation meeting. I am happy to return control to our Toastmaster of the day, Carolina Ramirez. Take it away, Carolina. Thank you very much, Jim. Great job. And what can I say about ambition? I have so many ambitions that maybe I will need another life to achieve everything I want to do. And saying this, I hope you have ambitions as well. Andy, the meeting is yours. Back to you. Oh, thank you very much, Carolina. Of course, you did a wonderful job. We're all impressed and happy for the job that you did leading us through this meeting. I will mention again that there is a method to sign up for next week for the special activities that we have. 
And I look forward to seeing everybody signing up so that we don't have to run after you. However, if there's one person with seven minutes left to our meeting that wants to point out that they want to be the Toastmaster of the day, please raise your hand so we can give David that opportunity of saying, this person will take control of the meeting next week. Does anybody have their hand up? Did I see David's hand up? 